All right. So we are back in order. And at this point in time, our business takes us to the non-action items, if the clerk could read. AS discussion regarding the 2021 City of Topeka operating budget. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. So tonight we continue our discussion on the budget um, with a focus on the Utilities Department tonight. So I'll first turn it over to Jessica and she can provide information and then we'll hear from Bob Sample um, regarding utilities project or utilities budget. Jessica. Hi, good evening again. Um, so Bob and his team at utilities is going to go over um, some of the operational changes that have been included recently and then also will be implemented with the 2021 budget if approved. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to utilities. They're going to um, go through their presentation. Obviously, we can take questions tonight. Um, and as a reminder, before we hand it fully over, um, next week will be the um, public budget discussion. So if you're getting questions from constituents, you know we can encourage um, participation in a variety of fashions, whether that is in person or if people don't feel safe doing that, they can they can provide those questions in advance. Um, and I'm sure there's a variety of other ways that um, we can address that topic. We want to make sure people are included and are able to participate. Um, we haven't received any specific amendments from council members. So those are items that we could start modeling and giving you feedback on if you did have specific suggestions or concerns about different areas of the budget. Um, we have two sets of questions that we still are working on to get back to you. So you should have those by the end of the week. Um, and so with that, unless there's questions for the overall budget process, um, I'll hand it over to utilities. Thank you. Good evening. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, talk about the utilities uh, proposed 2021 budget. Uh, I'll be presenting tonight uh, the budget for the three utility funds, which are stormwater, water, and wastewater. Uh, we have a total utility budget of uh, 87 million is supported by our recent rate, rate study completed in 2019. And out of that rate study came the rate increases that were approved for 2021, 2022, and 2023, which will allow us to take a two pronged approach to fund capital improvements through both debt service and cash. So I know everyone wants to see utilities department run, run efficiently. And I can assure you that uh, my management team and myself have that very same desire. So I wanna take just a few minutes to talk about some things that I've done, as well as some things I'm gonna do in the future to make sure that happens. So to start out with, uh, I've been looking at the utilities department for a couple of years. I've done a uh, top-down review of the organization, and about three months ago, I restructured. Um, with that restructuring, then, I eliminated uh, four management positions um, with a net a uh, annual cost savings of $300,000. And you can find that organizational chart on page 156. So if I was to not do anything else with utilities, we would continue to gain efficiency simply because of the way the managers manage. They're continually looking to optimize resource sharing, uh, streamlining processes, and reviewing overtime practices. But I do plan on doing more. Uh, I've actually got a plan uh, to further the optimizing of the utilities department. That plan uh, is a four-phased approach, and I wanted to visit with you about those four phases. Uh, first phase is to break down the entire department into small functional areas, then identify metrics to determine how well our operations are performing. I'm in phase one of this plan right now. Uh, second phase is benchmarking, where I'll, where I'll get a consultant to help be uh, compared to similar utilities, both public and privately operated. And then the third phase will be when we receive the data to evaluate the efficiencies and effectiveness, effectiveness of our operations. Uh, the fourth phase then is once we have that information and we've uh, determined uh, those areas that are doing well and those areas that we need to make improvements, 
will create action plans for those areas that need improvement. And this will be a long-term two-year process, but I really am hoping to implement something that is sustainable and uh, something that utilities will be able to use for years to come to determine, to determine their efficiency. So I want to talk a little bit about how we're going to develop the action plans. Um, first of all, we're going to share the data with employees. I believe wholeheartedly that employees are our greatest resource to accomplish our mission, so this will be a collaborative effort. Uh, we'll sit down with these employees and share, uh, and share the data and, and uh, work to gain commitment to become efficient within a specific time frame. And some of the tools that we'll have in our tool bag to use to, to go through this process first would be if, if we defined a process issue, uh, we've all been trained in the RPI, or the Rapid Process and Improvement Process, uh, thanks to the city manager. That's a tool that we'll have to use. Uh, but if it's, if, it's not a, if it's not a process issue and it's a deferred maintenance issue, then we will use the, the reallocation of resources, uh, cross-training, and outsourcing. Uh, but the bottom line is we must become efficient in these areas where we're not. I got a, a couple of main goals as we go through this, this optimizing process. First of all is to address, uh, define and address deferred maintenance within the department. I think it's very important that we address deferred maintenance because deferred maintenance on an asset is only going to make that asset need to be replaced sooner than it should be. Secondly, and ultimately, will be to find efficiency so all savings realized can be transferred to funding replacements of our aging infrastructure. So cash uh, transfers are a part of our operating budget, and the strategy then is to find efficiencies throughout our operations and then transfer cash to doing infrastructure replacement and improvement. So I've had some experience uh, with this about 20 years ago with, at uh, WPC, we went through an optimization process. So I plan on capitalizing on the things that went very well with that, through that process and either eliminating or readjusting the things that didn't go so well. So I appreciate you letting me have the time to talk, talk about some of the things that we're, we're doing to, uh, to make sure we're efficient, running efficiently. With that, I'll move right into uh, highlighting uh, major changes in the budget that affect all three funds. <clears throat> First, uh, uh, from previous budget meetings, we know that the city had an increase in property insurance. Utilities uh, property insurance increased uh, almost $700,000, which is the reason that uh, we see the contractual budget increasing. Um, our budget for debt service has increased by $2.1 million uh, due to new debt issuance costs. But a really good story is, is our cash transfers have increased by $6.3 million uh, to significant, significantly pay for infrastructure replacement projects with cash. So transfers are a part of our operating budget, and, that's, and we've increased the cash transfers by $6.3 million, uh, I believe as a combined utility, we're at $11.5 million for cash transfers. So these uh, increases alone account for the majority of the total budget increases. I'd like to highlight the uh, aspects of each of the three funds, starting with the water. And you can find the water budget starting on page uh, 157. So we have budget increases related to our uh, SCADA uh, support requirements and cyber security enhancements. So our SCADA stands for uh, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. It's a system, a uh, very important system to us that uh, allows us to uh, remotely uh, control and monitor our water and wastewater pump stations, our towers, as well as our water and wastewater treatment plants. So we've also uh, seen an increase in personnel services as a result of the timing of the last labor uh, contract along with uh, continued rising health insurance costs. 
A good new project that I want to talk about is uh, our advanced metering infrastructure. In other words, our a, uh, AMI project, which is 50% of the way uh, complete. Um, and the AMI then will allow us to remotely read water meters, uh, which means that in our meter services area, we'll find efficiency simply because we don't have to send out a vehicle and employee to uh, pass by those meters. So I thought I might stop right now and see if you have any questions on the water fund. Any questions for Bob on the water funds? Seeing none, you may proceed. Thank you. Next, we'll talk about the stormwater budget, which is you can find on page 159. So we have a budget in, increased for the lift bridge inspection services and the levy maintenance unit. So our agreement with the Corps is to annually inspect and operate the railroad lift bridge. So as we continue to seek out more efficiencies in stormwater, uh, as well as in all utility operations, we're evaluating our crew sizes. Um, and one example of the uh, efficiency we most recently gained was in our wastewater pump station uh, emergency call crew. For many years, and even as long as I've been here, that crew, uh, we would send two people out when we get a pump station alarm and uh, they would do whatever they needed to do to, to take care of that pump station. We're now only sending one person out to investigate the situation and then determine if they need to uh, call for assistance. And uh, many times it's a, we, we get a pump station with uh, an alarm, a uh, false alarm, or maybe it's just something uh, where we push a button and start a pump. So it would be that person's uh, uh, responsibility to make that determination, but we do have uh, certainly people waiting uh, if they need assistance. So in the utilities department, I've had GPS uh, units on vehicles uh, within the department. Uh, but we most recently have moved to a, an updated system. We refer to it as ABL or automated vehicle location system. And this system, uh, gives us live information as to, as to where our uh, vehicles and crews are working. Um, one of the advantages of having this type of system is certainly it's scheduling. If we get a customer with an urgent concern, we'll know exactly where our staff are and we can disperse them to uh, help the customer. Also, if we have a safety issue and somebody gets hurt, we know exactly where our crews are and we'll be able to uh, get the, the appropriate help to them. Um, this system will also uh, provide live information for vehicle speeds as well as uh, information on uh, when a vehicle is uh, idling but still running. So I'll stop there and see if you have any questions about our stormwater fund. Bob, it doesn't, oh yeah, Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had submitted this question earlier to Jessica, but maybe we can knock it off the list. And the question was about this, the hydraulic bridge inspection. Is that for the train bridge that is west of Topeka Boulevard? Uh, yes, that is correct. Well, maybe this is a conversation for off camera, but my understanding is that we all know that the hydraulics got stolen out of that some years ago. And it doesn't seem like it's worth it to spend $140,000 just to say it's not there. Okay, and, I, and we have some history on that, and I, I'm going to uh, throw it over to Braxton to talk about that a little bit. Thank you, Council Member Hiller, for the question. Uh, we have put together a, a formal response that I'm sure finance is going to get to you. But the railroad, at its own cost, completely reconstructed all of the lifting mechanisms in that bridge. Uh, and it is functional. Under the contract that we have with the UP Railroad, there is a very elaborate, elaborate set of inspections four times a year, once each quarter, with two reports, as well as two different times where they have to actually go in and operate the lifting bridge, the five different sections of it, 
Um, and the, as part of the negotiations, it took four years on this amended operating agreement. The railroad flatly refused to pay any of these costs. And, and as the response that we provided to finance will come to you, going, harkening back to the 1950s agreements, the city is ultimately responsible for operating and maintaining that lifting apparatus. So the railroad was able to put that cost on us. So I'm, I'm happy to go into great detail and share the operating and maintenance agreement with you. Okay, I mean, my recollection was for, for a number of years, it was in the capital budget and it was super expensive and we didn't do it. And everybody was sort of looking the other way or, or something. I mean, we're, there's a plan to take that out of service at some point. And so I did not know that it had actually been repaired. So I guess yes. that's good news. And there, the, thank you, and we actually had earmarked some money potentially to offset the liability in the event that the railroad came back to us and wanted us to participate in the cost of that. But ultimately, they bore the entire cost of rehabilitating and reconstructing all of the lifting mechanisms on that bridge. Wow. As I recall, that was a pretty hefty amount of money. So thank you for that update. I did not know that. Any additional questions for the team? Yes. Oh, yes, Councilman Duncan, yes. Are the property insurance increases part of that larger big number we dealt with, or are they a separate other insurance increases you've seen? Does that question make sense? <laughs> They're part of the general overall increase that we received for okay. this year. Okay. And it's just he's referencing it in the utilities department because of all of the facilities that we have for utilities. It's a okay. hefty number. Well, and the reason I asked that means this, we yeah, already, it, the steps we're taking to look at that will be right. included in that. Right. Issue. It was okay. in line with what we had from the general fund or from, from that standpoint. Okay. So it's not separate. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Councilman Lesser, did I see you raise your hand? No? Councilwoman Hiller? Thank you. I had one other question, and I'm not sure which sub-utility it goes in. Um, Bob, you mentioned that you had um, eliminated three high-level positions, I think, when you, when you started your presentation here. Um, to be honest, I can't quite keep track of things that happened a couple months ago. Then there have been some other changes recently citywide. And so my question is, is, is all of the downsizing that happened either three months ago or recently reflected in the budget that we have before us? Or at this point, would that budget be somewhat reduced? Um, yes, and Councilwoman, I, I re, uh, reduced, uh, uh, I eliminated four uh, management positions. Um, so uh, I did not reduce the budget. Uh, and the reason why is because I really feel like we need to go through this optimization uh, process and uh, and at some point then determine where those resources need to end up. Um, it very well could be as if, as if we determine that we have some deferred maintenance, we may need to, to reallocate the positions. Um, or it also could mean that uh, if we outsource that we may need to increase uh, our contractual budget. Uh, ultimately, the goal, though, is to find find efficiencies so that we can move funds to the uh, to the cash transfer, which is cash transfer, which is really a part of our operating budget. So the strategy, and that is exactly the strategy. I don't uh, I don't think we need to reduce the budget. I think we need to find efficiencies and increase the cash transfers. Um, okay, and and back to the the personnel, and I, I I didn't stop you at water, but the stormwater and the wastewater look fairly static across the three years that we have in our line item breakdowns, but the the um, the employee compensation in water goes up. $367,000, so it's about 6%. Is that all 
Is that what we were supposed to expect from the labor contract? Um, yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let uh, Nicole Malott talk a little bit about that. Really what you're seeing there, um, it's actually the impact of, of a two-year cycle. Um, the timing of the last labor contract uh, was finalized after uh, the personnel budget was completed for the 2020 budget. So what you're seeing is actually the impact of both the 2020 and the 2021 hitting um, in the 2021 budget time frame, if that makes sense. Um, now, there was some funding uh, allocated for uh, additional increases due to labor contracts, but it definitely came in a little bit more than, than we had planned on and had budgeted for. Hmm. Yeah, just just seemed like a lot. And I, I noticed that the health insurance, again, it's different from department to department, but went up $136,000 on the same employees. Right. Yeah, that really it comes down to the elections that the employees choose, um, whether they're choosing single coverage, family, um, has a big impact on uh, what that cost is. Um, thank you. Um, is, is it fair for me to ask that, and, and or maybe assume, um, which is always dangerous, but that um, a lot of the increases that we're seeing in our staff and in our coverage, is it because potentially uh, family members have lost their employer employment and then our employees are picking up their families now in their insurance? I, that would be very hard to say. I don't know if somebody from finance or HR wants to take that question. Um, this is Jeff. I wouldn't say that in the 21 budget for most departments that's the case, but I think that that point is really important and that's something that we could see more of if I don't think it's the way that it is. Okay. All right, additional questions for our team. All right, you may proceed. Okay, I would like to discuss the wastewater budget, which can be found on page 161 of your budget books. Um, like water, the budget increase related to the SCADA system support requirements and cyber security enhancements have gone up. Uh, but I want to highlight a project that's coming online that's a really cool project, and that is our biogas project. And that's where with the Oakland wastewater treatment plant, we're taking methane gas that's produced naturally uh, as we treat the waste. And we're taking that gas and making it into a quality product that we can put back in the pipeline itself. And so uh, that project is starting up right now and will end in April of 2021. Uh, and we should, uh, we, uh, we should expect about $1.3 million to be fully captured in 2022. Any questions? We don't see any. You may proceed. I, I have one on the. Oh, okay. Councilwoman Hiller. I have one on the overall budget. Were you finished, or, or I mean, the wastewater budget? No, go ahead. I've, I've got one last thing that I wanted to end with, but uh, no, I. Please let me know your question. Well, that'll maybe that's where my question is. It had to do with debt service. Um, I was looking at the chart and then the comment, and it said that the debt service and other expense categories changed by 6.4 million overall, including a decrease for debt payments of about 600,000 and an increase on an anticipated debt of basically 1.2 million. But the overall, it went up $2 million, and so I couldn't reconcile that. Okay, and again, I'll uh, let uh, Nicole respond. We tried to, in the way the budget is presented, try to correct uh, confusion in previous years. Uh, we have always budgeted for known debt service. Uh, when we prepare the budget in the debt service lines and that debt service is not known, so like our issuance that will go out for later this year 
we have an estimate of what that will be. Historically, we've budgeted that under other costs, which is why you'll see that higher number on the other cost line in 2020 budget. But on the 2021, it, it's been reduced down um, to only 100,000, and that's where the offset comes from. We've taken that unknown debt service other cost and actually combined it into the debt service line. Okay. Um, and that's where your net your net works out when you when you look at the two lines together. Thanks. I couldn't couldn't figure it out. Thank you, Mayor. All right, Bob. Okay, and then uh, certainly uh, last but not least, uh, I've been uh, scrutinizing purchases. I've been looking at purchases very, very hard and uh, making a decision on whether we're going to spend money on certain things or not. Certainly, if it's a want or a nice to have, we're not, we're not making those purchases. Uh, but if it's a true necessity, we are. And uh, I've come across something that I've decided to not spend money on. Um, and so, uh, we won't be uh, supplying the Topeka water bottles anymore. And I know it's something we've done for a lot of years, and I really hate to do it. We've taken these bottles of water around to different events, but I think with the current times, the best thing is just to halt the spending on those bottles. I know that we've been supplying uh, the council with these bottles of water, and I really do appreciate uh, seeing those bottles at the council meeting. And so I'm going to apologize to all the council that uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, be uh, uh, buying any more of the, of the bottled water. <clears throat> With that said, though, uh, I really want to see the council drinking uh, Topeka water and drinking it out of a, uh, uh, a container that says City Topeka Utility. So what I've done is I went uh, uh, rummaging through a, a closet here at the water plant. And I found some bottles, um, and these bottles, these, these are refillable bottles, they actually say City of Topeka Utilities. And so I actually even took it a step further, and I've uh, personalized these for, for everybody on the governing body. So uh, I'm going to drop these off uh, at the council office, and you will all have uh, a bottle that you can refill, and I really hope that you continue to drink uh, Topeka water. And here's an example that I know it's awful small. I did not pay with pay for this with city funds, uh, but this one is the mayor's uh, 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 daily stuff. So there you go. I don't know if you can see it from here, but you can pick these bottles up uh, at the council office. Again, I apologize for not providing the bottled water anymore. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Bob, you're a class act, and um, thank you for that kindness of, of being able to say, hey, we're, we're looking at our budget, and you see that we use the water, and for you to just go the extra step to personalize our bottles, that is so touching. Thank you so much for doing that. And also, equally as important as your kindness, is your competence in working with this department. The fact that you have increased our transfer so that we can continue doing cash projects is nothing but the, the, the work that this council has asked of this, this team for a while. Um, and, and to see that, yes, it has been painful to have to take a look at increases in our services, but that these increases are going back to our infrastructure and that you're still figuring out how you're going to continue that cash trend, even after you make reductions, it's it's something that is, it, it just demonstrates your confidence. So thank you very much. Uh, we have several hands. Let's start with Councilwoman Nader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you to the utilities team. Um, I, again, want to speak to your competence. It's just really wonderful to look at these numbers and to hear how you're compensating for everything. Um, I do just want to go ahead and also thank you for moving in a more green direction with our water bottles, but also um, just to let people know to use Topeka tap water to wash those water bottles out or else you'll end up with a very beautiful piece of plastic art after it's done in the dishwasher. I know this from personal experience. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, that's all. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think Councilman uh, Deputy Mayor was also raising his hands, or Councilman Dobler. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
Mr. Sample, uh, Braxton, Nicole, uh, I'd like to express my gratitude. I think when rate increases were passed uh, earlier this year or late last year, I can't remember which, um, you, you know, the, they were passed with the caveat that uh, the utilities department would handle them with care and that means put every dollar possible into the ground in the form of, of new pipe to replace our aging infrastructure. Uh, with the moves that you've made over the last few months, uh, you've done exactly that. And you did it in really in six months after, after receiving those uh, rate increases. I hope, uh, I hope other city departments are looking at the, at the model that you've uh, set forth um, it's always easy to say, you know, we can't do that. We, we're, we're not getting enough money. We, you know, we can't provide full service unless you give us more, uh, more funding. I think you've gone the other direction. And uh, I'd certainly encourage everybody to, to uh, take a look at the model uh, that utilities uh, Councilwoman Ortiz. Uh, you're muted, Councilwoman. You're Ortiz. muted, Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, Bob, I just want to thank you. Um, can you tell me how much um, cutting off our water is going to save us? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, so we, we use the bottled waters for a lot of different events. Uh, the the uh, event over Gar Garfield Park is one. So we're going to save about $1,500 a year. $1,500? Yes, $1,500 a year. Okay, thank you, Bob. Other questions or comments for Mr. Sample? Councilwoman Hiller. Oh. oh, no, sorry. All right. Okay, so we do have, before we go any further, we have some individuals signed up to speak in public comment on this issue, which is the budget. I know that we probably have a little bit more to go, but I wanted to take this time to have comment as well before we keep moving forward. The first person signed up to speak is Mr. Joseph Ledbetter. Good evening, Governing Body. Hey, Mike. <laughs> He's looking right at me. Uh, hey, uh, I'm going to leave Bob alone tonight. Uh, Bob does a good tour of that uh, water plant for uh, little little relatives. Uh, but I do have some concerns about those transfers. I want to make sure they're actually going into the ground and they're not being transferred to the general budget. Because I know when I looked at the budget last year, over two and a half million was being transferred from the water department uh, utilities to the general budget. So I wasn't quite sure uh, if that is in fact what's going on. If it is, that's great. If it's actually replacing water lines. Uh, I'm sure Bob will take a phone call from me and uh, give me that answer. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I believe in, I'm going to talk about the general budget because I'm not sure I can make it next week uh, because we have Parks and Rec uh, meeting that night. Uh, what I'd like to talk about uh, right off the top is my support and the support of probably 99% of the public of this city for our police department. Uh, we do not want to see them defunded. We don't want to see them reduced. Uh, in order to have a stable, uh, optimally run city, you have to have law and order. So uh, <clears throat> we need that. Uh, I also want to encourage uh, this body to do uh, very enhanced uh, retirement incentives. Uh, even if it's uh, beyond what you're uh, actually offering, uh, and I'm gonna send some emails on that. Uh, I'm working on uh, some of this over at the uh, uh, Metro Transfer, or the, our, our buses. Uh, I'm on that board, and uh, I've got a lot of work I've already done. I'm meeting with some of the board members tomorrow to talk about that, but if you look at, uh, uh, the Topeka Metro, we're, we're only a $10 million budget versus a $300 million budget. <clears throat> uh, one of the things I've noticed about the city of Topeka's numbers is from 2012 to now, we haven't reduced our personnel at all, and yet our population has dropped by 4%. So it's, uh, in doing the simple math, uh, 
leaving the emergency personnel alone, police and fire, <clears throat> it's my uh, belief that we should have uh, been able to reduce our staff by at least 48 positions over that last eight years, and we should have. Uh, pruning is always good for an organization. Uh, it actually uh, enhances productivity, uh, and there's many studies that show that. When you get rid of middle managers, who are basically just order takers, uh, when you get rid of extra supervisors that are unneeded, and Bob just alluded to that, uh, that actually slows down organization when you have all those extra positions in place. So when you get rid of those uh, personnel, those positions, you actually enhance productivity. And there are many studies out there that will prove that. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I'd like to see uh, done is, you know, a goal of at least 48 to 50 people taking uh, retirement incentives. Uh, I believe that in looking at the numbers of our staff and what we serve and the amount of our budget, uh, we should be at more like about 1,050 personnel, tops, not at 1,200. Uh, this should be coming from management, but uh, maybe it is now. But I did uh, certainly agree with the, uh, uh, the way that, uh, you know, we got rid of uh, like a deputy manager. I never did know why we had a deputy manager and I asked Colson that and he never could answer me but anyway he's gone but uh, I just encourage you to really do deep uh, restructuring you know you need additional time Mr. Ledbetter if if you'll give me two minutes I'll trade four minutes of public comment and leave early <laughs> <Deal. laughs> done, done. <laughs> Man, no. hands are going up all over the place. <laughs> it's a, um, so y'all see the screen I'm looking at. There is a trade of two for four. Um, we have a motion, I think, by several council members, but I'll take the motion from Deputy Mayor and Councilwoman Ortiz. Let us proceed with the vote to extend two minutes for Mr. Ledbetter. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Council Members Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Aqua? Yes. Ortiz? Oh, yes. Emerson? <laughs> and a static yes. Sonic yes. Padilla? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hager? Yes. Dobler? An enthusiastic yes. Duncan? Yes. And Lesser? For the record, I'll always take two for four over with Ledbetter. <laughs> we have 10 yes. That's a good deal. <laughs> 10 having voted yes. The motion passes. Mr. Ledbetter, I hope that you will remember this evening, the 21st of July, as a night that you had every council member elated with joy. Thank you. And, and I'm always glad. you a hard I'm, time. You know that we appreciate you. Well, I appreciate that. I am always here to entertain, okay, if nothing else. Okay. Yeah, right. So several of the things that I would be looking at as council member, and you are the, the board that governs this city. You are the governor. You are the managers. Uh, and this is your duty of oversight. I would look at uh, privatizing street repairs. I would be looking at doing that even starting uh, this year and into next year. I would be uh, looking at uh, privatizing water line repairs, more contractual services. I'd be bidding these things out at optimum rates. I'd be getting uh, these projects done quickly and fast. And uh, privatization is, is absolutely a great tool for a city this size to use, especially when you've had uh, so many years of complaints, complaints, complaints about water lines breaking, about uh, potholes not being fixed right. And you know you've heard it. So let's do something about it. Let's, let's start privatizing. Forestry. I don't know why we need a forestry department anymore when we have probably at least 20 good tree uh, services that we can use in this community that are private. Maybe you don't do it all at once. Maybe you just do half. But I do believe that there is a lot of potential, actually millions of dollars in savings by uh, doing some privatization uh, and optimizing uh, uh, the way I'm talking about cutting staff, cutting uh, any middle management, cutting uh, extra supervisors that you don't need. I heard of one lady, she told me that she has two employees and she's a supervisor. I said, really? <laughs> two people. So uh, 
and this was a city person. I'll leave names out of it. But anyway, I would like to see uh, our city uh, become much more streamlined and much more efficient. Again, I'm leaving uh, police and fire out of it. I think they're very important for emergency purposes. We need that. Uh, but uh, I think everything else is on the table. Another thing I would look at, one more thing. I'd look at selling these uh, or long-term leasing these uh, uh, parking garages. And thank you. It says three minutes, but I heard the ding. Thank you very much. You have a good evening. Thank you so much, Mr. Lovebetter. You have a wonderful evening. Uh, the next person signed up to speak again was, uh, I think, Nicole first. So I am um, back again, and I want to say I am. Um, I'm an advocate for random acts of kindness and senseless acts of beauty. So I think that giving water bottles is commendable. I'm all for the green movement. However, I'm not all for pollutants and tap water is not the best fun water we should be drinking. I think that the funds that we are looking at, how they should be allocated, um, sent out amongst the community should be going to a better quality of water that we have versus um, the health care and with the community's need because if they had a better water drinking system supplied to them they probably wouldn't need the increase in the medical insurance and coverage i'm listening to in all respect to um bob braxton and nicole and what they were speaking of but when we speak of the water fund the st increase storm water increase water waste increase all of our water bills are increasing and we are not seeing repairs nowhere we're seeing the roads are still like he said we should be fixing potholes in the roads before the winter comes and not during the day but maybe at night so that people can still be functionable um i also when he's saying we don't need to defund the police a lot of the funds that the police have can be reused in other places to where if they do need an increase in health care for these um, their employees, then we can use those funds there as well as instead of taxing the people and making sure that that money goes other places. When um, he speaks of the transfer and the grounds, and when I speak of him because I'm looking at Bob, I didn't really hear much information that impressed me with what Bob had to offer. So, and the same when it came to Braxton and Nicole. What they said was pretty much what we know. We want to take these money and use it for what we want to do and it's not for the people. And the people is what I believe is where it all needs to go to. Every one of us pays a water bill. Every one of us takes a shower, brushes our teeth, washes our hands. So this affects us all, not just here in this courtroom, but in our home, in our daily lives. And to constantly see increase in water, because when I look at my water bill now for waste, I'm paying $33 for waste going out. And I'm paying $45 for what I'm using, but my bill is $120. It's not adding up. And that's in fees, taxes, and other things that uh, we're hearing goes towards water bottles. Yeah, you didn't use the funds to personalize the water bottles, but the water bottles were purchased and then found. And that means those funds were used to buy the water bottles. And thanks, it's good that they are being used for something, but like having bottles here that are filled and already ready and contaminated free, I think would be still a continuous gesture why cut the water here and and say that's like helping the budget by 1500 a year when we have people paying that in a half a year and just their water services um i think that we should move towards a special session where we have an opportunity to speak and hear more from the people than just those who are in authority positions because this whole evening there have been things that have been brought up that after we spoke and then listened to you all speak we're not hearing any kind of resolve or clarity of the communication is being understood i i feel on uh, the three things that i've spoke on after i've sat down i was misunderstood in what i was stating and i asked for a continuance maybe two three more minutes is good 
Um, do, do we have a motion to extend Ms. Nicole's time to additional three minutes? Councilwoman Naker, do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a second. Um, we now proceed with voting. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Council members Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Acola? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. <coughs> Nager? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. And Lesser? No. We have nine yes, Mr. Lesser voting no. Ma'am, you have three more minutes. Thank you. So to wrap it up, to make it go faster, my point of what I'm speaking on as far as the budget is we need to look at the budget in a whole and make sure that those funds go where they are needed, not where it will benefit the individuals who are sitting in positions and are comfortable. Because there are a lot of people in our community, in our cities, and not just in low housing income environments, but I'm speaking all across Topeka because I lived in the community of Knollwood where it is a prestige community is what I was told. And I had war issues. I had house, I lived in a house where, where the pipes, my services are disconnected, yet water is still coming into my home. So that is showing me and telling me that we're paying these individuals to work and they're not working. And so what is the point of having an increase in budget for the fact of they need more to be able to do less? We need to have the budget be sent to where it needs to be all across the board, something done as far as a change. Small people don't need to be overlooked. If a person has two employees and they're a supervisor, that is what they are. They are supervising someone to do what is needed to be done. And instead of downsizing, looking as if they aren't doing the best because they only have two employees, maybe some of these positions need to be minimized to where less people are being monitored so that they'll be able to understand, oh, you didn't do what was needed to be done because they're looking at too many people and missing out on what's really being, what's taking place. And that is nothing's getting repaired and it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Uh, do we have uh, Jessica or or city manager that would like to proceed? I guess for me, I don't know, uh, Jessica, did you want to sum up or did you have anything else? Okay. Um, from our standpoint, as we move forward, um, we one week from today, we have our public hearing on the budget. So individuals that want to come and speak regarding the budget can do so. We also have our hearing on the uh, consolidated action plan. So those two will be going on next week in this council chambers at six o'clock. So if you have an interest in coming and making additional comments on the budget, please uh, be prepared to sign up and come to that hearing. And if you have amendments, as, as Jessica mentioned earlier, if you're looking at amendments, we'd like to know about them now, because at that point there is an item on the agenda for the meeting of the 28th that we would do amendments to the budget. Thank you, city manager. Okay. Um, at this point, I guess we move on to item B, which is the 2021-2025 of the clerk agreed. The B is discussion regarding the five-year consolidated action plan 2021 to 2025 and the fiscal year 2021 annual consolidated action plan and budget. Um, Mayor, tonight we were going to have a presentation by Corey Wright regarding the Consolidated Action Plan for 2021 through 2025. Um, she'll cover the areas that are included in the plan. Remember that what we're talking about is how we intend to spend the money that we receive through the CDBG allocations that we receive as an entitlement city. And so this outlines the various areas where we would spend those funds over the next five years. So, Corey, the floor is yours. Great. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Governing Bottery. Um, today I would like to talk about the 2021 to 2025 Consolidated Action Plan. It's our five-year action plan, and uh, we're excited to, to get to talk about that tonight. Well, 
I first want to talk about HUD objectives versus our department objectives. So the HUD objectives are suitable living environment, availability and accessibility, decent affordable housing, which is related to affordability, creating economic opportunities, opportunities and sustainability. Um, our department objectives, enhancing the quality of our neighborhoods, increasing home ownership, enhancing housing with support services, and of course, leveraging other resources. Tonight, uh, we will talk about the five-year uh, funding that's included in our five-year con plan. So um, this is a five-year total. So we'll, with our community development block grant funds, we'll receive approximately $9.2 million in funding. Our home program, $2.7 million in funding. Our emergency solutions grant program, $775,000 in funding. And then uh, our Shelter Plus Care, which is a competitive grant, which we'll talk more about here shortly, is approximately $8.6 million in funding. I do want to highlight a few of our key programs, the ones that we fund with, we use the most dollars to fund. And the first being our major rehab and our exterior rehab, which is our sort target area rehabilitation programs. Major rehab is for owner occupants. Um, the first $5,000 of this uh, repair program is a grant that is not to be repaid. If the home is built prior to 1978 and has been identified with lead-based paint, there's an additional $5,000 that could be a grant to remediate the lead in the home. This program is a maximum of $30,000 in repairs. After seven years, if, you're, if the owner-occupant resides in the home, 50% of that $30,000 is forgiven. The rest is a lien that's placed on the property that is, has no interest and just stays there until the home is sold or refinanced. So eligibility for this program, the owner, the, the owner must be an occupant for 90 days prior to applying for this program, must live within our targeted, our sort target areas. Um, all the work must be approved by the department is subject to availability of funds. We have a rehab standard that all of our programs have to meet and that is approved by HUD, so uh, the improvements have to meet that standard. Uh, they must qualify as low income, which is 80% of the median annual family income. Uh, some examples are repla replacement of single pane windows with energy star windows and repla replacing a uh, uh, energy efficient, efficient furnace, excuse me. Our exterior rehab program is a rental uh, uh, occupant program. So the rental owner must provide a 10% match of funding uh, that is paid first on the project. This is a max of $15,000 with 60% forgiven after seven years um, on the property. The eligibility is the same as the owner occupant. Um, the, however, the rental unit must be uh, affordable for a, a period of time, depending on how much money is, is uh, loaned on the home. The emergency repair and the weatherization programs are two programs. The minimum for these two programs are $300, with a maximum for the emergency repair program at $15,000 and for the weatherization program at $7,500. The first $1,500 is a grant with no repayment for the first occurrence. Um, the income must not exceed 60% of the HUD uh, median household income. The owner must reside in the property for more than one year prior to application. And then again, 50% is forgiven after seven years of occupancy. Examples of, of emergency repairs that we commonly see in the department are sewer lines, water heater, furnace, electrical roof, and air conditioning if medically necessary. <laughs> Weatherization, we predict to see installation of attic and walls, uh, furnace, air conditioning, windows, and potentially siding. Our accessibility programs is, is uh, one that's very popular in our program. Uh, we do owner-occupied and rental with this program. The owner-occupied has a maximum of $6,000 for the exterior, which includes a uh, ramp and, say, the, the widening of the outside door, uh, $4,500 for the interior, and $1,500 for mobile homes. The housing income limit can't exceed 80% of the HUD median household income. And assistance is provided for this program as a grant, so there's no lien uh, placed on the property. This is limited to one access into the home, into the bathroom, and to, into the bedroom. Um, so bathroom modifications include grab bars, high-rise toilet, um, walk-in shower. It depends on the, the need of the actual constituent. 
For rental units, we only do exterior, and that max is $4,000. Um, and that exterior, again, being typically a ramp and the widening of the front door for them to be able to gain access into the home. Our voluntary demolition program, we don't have a lot of money in this program, but it sure does come in handy when we have a, a house where uh, someone doesn't have the means to uh, demolish the property and it needs to be demolished. So we have two different payback mechanisms for this program. One's with owners with income below 80% of the median income and one with uh, incomes above 80% of the median. So owners with income below, if they use it for non-residential use, they have to repay 50% of that cost back um, to the city. Um, with owners of income above 80% of the, medi the median income reuse for non-residential, they would pay 75% back. Residential rental, they'd pay 50% back. And reuse for owner-occupied, they would pay 25% back um, for that per particular program. We also have a really amazing uh, Topeka Opportunity to Own program, which is our home ownership program, which provides up to $30,000 for low-income home buyers for rehabilitation of their newly acquired property. Um, this is, again, another program where 50% is forgiven after seven years of occupancy. The home buyer must go through credit counseling with uh, housing and credit counseling, and the newly acquired home purchase cannot be over $75,000. Um, the household e median income can't be over 80% of the current um, HUD median household income. We have two amazing community housing development organizations in Topeka, Habitat for Humanity and Cornerstone of Topeka. Uh, partnerships with Cornerstone uh, provide rehabilitation of rental units for low-income residents. We house many people with Cornerstone as well with our Shelter Plus Care program. Partnerships with Cornerstone and Habitat uh, provide also new infill housing for low-income residents. So um, we occasionally use some Chodo set-aside funds um, for activities to do infill. All of the, the renters and the households that are using Chodo set-aside funds must be 80% of the current HUD median household income. We are required uh, by HUD to use 15% of our home funds for set aside for CHODO, and we do that every year. We usually do more than that by, by offering a CHODO operating, operating subsidy as well. Um, and then the landlords agree to an affordability period applied to the rental rehab. So depending on how much money we invest in the property depends on how many years they have to keep that property affordable, and we check that annually. And here's some examples of some Choto <laughs> homes that we've done in the past. We also have our emergency solutions grant program. This, this, yes. I am so sorry to interrupt you, but I'm looking at the clock and it's 949. Um, if you don't mind, we have to make a really simple vote to suspend the city council, uh, the, the meeting rules, so that we could go past 10. Uh, so do we have a motion for extension past 10 o'clock? We have a motion by the deputy mayor and a second by Councilwoman Nager. If there's no comments or questions, we proceed by voting. Mayor De La Isla? Yes. Council members Hiller? Yes. Valdivia Acola? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Padilla? Yes. Nager? Yes. Dobler? Yes. Duncan? Yes. And Lesser? Yes. We have 10 yes. All right. Corey, sorry that I interrupted you. Um, you may proceed. No problem. Um, so we do have emergency solutions grant program. This program is very specific and offers really four opportunities for us to use these funds. Rapid rehousing, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's for people who are already homeless. We provide deposit and first month's rent with that money. Um, emergency shelter operations, which is emergency shelter operations. And then homeless prevention, which is our um, homeless prevention, which provides um, eviction assistance or prevention uh, from people getting evicted. We also can use the money for homeless management information system, which is our database that tracks services that are used in the community. We began uh, managing the homeless management information system back in 2018. 
Our Continuum of Care Shelter Plus Care Program, which is our competitive grant, so we apply for this grant every year. It's approximately $1.7 million. It provides rental assistance to people who are homeless and have one of three disabilities, um, severe persistent mental illness, chronic substance abuse, or HIV AIDS. Um, these people have to be in services with a provider at least monthly, and they pay approximately 30% of their monthly gross income towards rent. We have one exception. We have one provider, Second Chance Services, which is our housing first provider, which does not require support services. So their referrals are coming in and they're offering services, but they're not required. And that's considered a housing first approach. So they're the only ones of our providers that offer that opportunity. We also have neighborhood support. So we have NIA support, which is our newsletters and uh, su supporting the events that the neighborhoods put on. Uh, different activities within the neighborhoods. We have neighborhood beautification and anti-blight, which is our inmate crews. They provide mowing and edging, uh, offer sidewalk repair and some cleanups within the neighborhood. And then we have our empowerment program, which does uh, things such as uh, signs, banners, pedestrian crossings and uh, lights. So this last slide here is uh, an annual look at our 2021 consolidated action plan. So this is our budget for just the 2021 year. I want to highlight just the, the main thing that pops out on this plan is that we have this columns over here, housing development, community development, neighborhood services, and homeless and social services. We really try to um, focus our dollars in the housing section. Um, especially now that we have the housing study that outlines that we definitely have some needs um, for those services. So the main difference between the 2020 budget and the 2021 budget is a slight reduction in the empowerment program from 137 to 60,000. And then the addition of a weatherization program of $77,890. That program, um, even though a small amount, it's a, it's a start in the right direction, and, and the housing study does say that um, that is a need in our community, so we thought we'd go ahead and start out something small. Uh, we predict that that will serve about 10, 10 to 13 households with approximately 30, 35 uh, people that are affected by that program, so it could be significant. And, and as you know, weatherization reduces housing costs sometimes by up to 12%. So that's um, exciting for, uh, to help reduce housing cost burden for some folks in the community. So, and with that, I'll stand for any questions you might have. Questions for Corey. Seeing none, thank you so much for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, at this point in time, we start moving on to the public comments. The first person signed up to speak is Joanna Becker. Thank you. Um, I'm a affiliated with Black Lives Matter, and I have a list of demands. Um, we demand a special session to discuss further comprehensive uh, police reform. We demand provisions to overhaul qualified immunity for law enforcement, and this be placed into the actual FOP contract. We demand prohibitions on racial profiling. We demand a ban on chokeholds and classifying it as a criminal offense. We demand establishing a registry of police misconduct maintained by the P Department of Justice. We demand that if no knock warrant no knock ban violates the FOP contract that we renegotiate the contract. The fact that it may should call for a renegotiation within itself because we all want this in our community. Page 102, Article 21, Management Rights, states the management reserves the right to direct the work of the employees. By this, you are acknowledging the life and the lives of those killed by police brutality and pledging never again. And to do anything less is a sign of open willingness to stand on the wrong side of history. And again, we demand a special session to do further discuss police reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next uh, person signed up to speak is Thomas Muther.
Hello again. <clears throat> oh, I guess I should put on reading glasses. In 1994, I entered the fight to keep the death penalty out of Kansas, eventually becoming the vice chair of the Kansas Coalition Against the Death Penalty. Our efforts sadly failed, and the death penalty has been with us these last 26 years. As far as death penalty law goes, ours was a fairly good one, and that was clear and limited its use to only a few offenses. Of course, fairly good in this context means it was a disaster. And I could go on to explicate why, but I didn't come here to speak about the death penalty. I only bring it up because, as I noted, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the death penalty's use has been strictly limited to a few specific crimes. Nowhere is there any indication that it is to be used on someone who discharges a firearm in a public park or runs away from police in said park. And it certainly does not authorize its use without lawyer, judge, trial, or possibility for appeal. Yet, isn't this exactly what happened in the case of Mr. White? Some of you may be tired of hearing about this case, but I'm afraid it isn't going away anytime soon, as it remains a flagrantly outrageous injustice, an open, festering wound on the body politic, the community we share a wound to which no one has yet made a serious attempt to apply a bomb, let alone heal. And how could it possibly heal when the perpetrators, to the best of my knowledge, continue to roam freely, worse, continue to carry badge and gun, and the ability to inflict other mortal wounds to the people of Topeka? This is more than ignoring the wound. This is pouring salt into said wound. This is our police department, our city, taunting the family of Mr. White and those who care about justice, like a demented second grader, standing on the corpse of Dominique White, thumbs and ears, fingers waving, tongue protruded, chanting, nya, 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 nya. I happen to know at least a dozen people who have lost a loved one to murder. And I have listened to their stories many times. Terrible, tragic tales of loss, grief, and rage. None of these particular losses were by the hand of a police officer, however. Someone supposedly entrusted with protecting and serving the community. And none of them had the experience of knowing for certain who that perpetrator was and watching them leave their wives unabated, unpunished, free to shoot someone else in the back if they wished. I cannot imagine what that must be like. I'm not here to say that those two officers are irredeemable, they should, they, that they should be executed or thrown into prison for the rest of their lives, but to suffer no consequences, not even a slap on the wrist of losing their jobs. I have been arrested four times for peaceably demonstrating against the death penalty. I spent a minimum of 12 hours and a maximum of about 38 hours in jail and had to pay a fine of $50 each time. Apparently, the crime of peaceful protest is more worthy of punishment in this country than shooting a young black man in the back and, remind, and a reminder he had no weapon in his hand when he was shot. This is justice in America? Justice in Topeka? Really? If we can't do better than this, but we can, and we must. Um, I just want to make clear that these comments are no way meant to impugn the motives or the goodwill of the members of this council. Just take it as a, in, uh, a, urgence, um, um, a way to just try to urge you to greater action um, because it's very Mr. much needed. Mr. Muther, do you need more time? Um, not really. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. The next person signed up to speak is Regina Platt. Thank you, beautiful people. Today I want to talk about, we already set a list of demands out in previous weeks. Um, I already introduced and began the conversation about restorative justice and restorative practices. But today I want to talk about a piece that I haven't spoken about, and it's about our youth. 
And I said a few words about them, but the thing I want to say today is when I thank you, um, Chief. I, I, I love what is happening and impacting our community right now in the conversations we are having. But I work inside the juvenile correctional facility. And I work with those young men and women who have been impacted by the community, the drug addictions, who have been impacted by uh, parents not being in the households, who have been impacted by people seeing them based off the color of their skin or the social economical standard. And so today I want to ask, can we, will police reform do a little bit more with de-escalation techniques? Um, with how we're talking to young people, with how we're talking not only to the young people, but how we are addressing the women. Um, women do not take to the same uh, approach or conversation that men take care uh, take to, nor do someone dealing with a high, that has a high level of trauma take to it the, in the same way. So we have young men who may would have been able to be helped by seeing the police officer, but all he seen was a uniform. And he became frightened and began to run. I know for myself, my son, when he had his encounter with the police department, he ran. He completely was scared up out of his flesh, had never had the contact before, and he ran. And so his charges um, racked up on him a little differently. And I had people approach me and say, if I knew that was your son, I wouldn't have treated him that way. And for me, that hurts even more because not only if that was my son, but that was someone's son. That was someone's child. And so I ask that we work on um, a little, go in a little deeper on our de-escalation techniques. As well, I, I wanted to address, we talked about softening the uniform. We're putting police officers while they're in the schools. It doesn't care, it doesn't matter how soft you put it. That's still a police officer in the presence of a young man or in the presence of a young woman. And a young woman may take kindly to that, but a young African-American male or a young brown Latino male takes to being demoralized and isolated and feeling like the approach is him being incarcerated and burdened down. Um, so I ask that we look at that area. Are there mentors that we can put into the schoolhouses? Is there programs that we can resource them to before they feel like they're being placed in a police car and being cuffed up? I've seen that there's been um, children in elementary schools here in our city who have been cuffed up and taken down uh, to intake. What does that look like as an approach in a schoolhouse when a young person is put in the cuffs and carried off? How does that impact their intellect for years to come up after that? So I want us to get to the point where we do that de-escalation approach, not only the de-escalation approach, the body camera approach, not only just being a body camera, you are wearing body cameras. Are our body cameras having a good uh, accessible access to audio not and video? Um, as we are coming in contact with the young people so we can review what we could have done differently and on the flip side be able to see how that child was in fear for their life when the approach began to happen. Um, and we talked about everybody came together on some things. But I'm not hearing everybody come together understanding that the, the things that we're dealing with now are not dealing with. They're impacting not only this generation, but the unborn generation that's coming after us. And either we're going to choose to stand up now, or we're going to choose to allow our kids to die later. Stand up. You need more time, Ms. Black? I'm done, baby. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> questions? Uh, Thank you, Mayor. I would have a question of Ms. Platt. I know, Ms. Platt, that you work with youth, and I, I'm sure that you know another uh, number of mothers that have their kids in high school. Uh, can you tell me what your belief is overall with mothers of color? brown, black, or lower income uh, white mothers, what their views are about having uh, police in schools at so many, you know, at middle school and at high schools? I mean, is it something that is seen as a positive in your experience or some, something that's seen as a negative? Because I know you, you deal with a lot of people. Well, it hasn't been a positive. Most of my youth that have been incarcerated uh, the process begun in the schools. 
So, it, it, and not to even say that it began in the schoolhouse, it began with the trauma that they were dealing with in the community. But in the schoolhouse, when they were, when they were struggling, the youth that came to school with marijuana, um, if you look up um, some of the guys that did the work on restorative, did the work on um, trauma-informed schooling, uh, you will see that they set up, it was a school that they used out of um, Los Angeles. And the way that it was set up, they put them in a programming that worked with that youth. Not that they took that youth and incarcerated them, because if I find out that a child has marijuana in his book sack and I send him to jail, did I deal with the youth, the, the issue that the youth was having, or did I deal with the behavior that the youth was having? So you've seen the marijuana, but you never seen the kid, right? But if I can assist the kid with dealing with the issue, assist the kid with dealing with the confidence issues, assist the kid with dealing with the peer and bullying issues, assist the, the kid in dealing with the, the domestic violence or the drug that may issues that may be going on in the community, I can equip the kid to be successful in the school building, understand that they're being heard and valued. So if we're going to go into school, Officer Bell was one of the great examples that I can give you that he worked his way through in the schooling and it wasn't about him being in the uniform. It was about him learn getting relationships and connecting connections with the young people. And some people are not doing that. That's not what they're in the school doing. They don't have an understanding. They don't have a relationship with the young. They have implicit, some have implicit biases when it comes to so different um, ethnic groups and they approach that child based off that group. And if he looks like a man, he's treated like a man. But just because he may be 6'2 and built like a, the bodybuilder of a year does not mean that his mental capacity is there. We've all done the research. You know that the brain is not even at its point of development until after 25 years of age. Who's in high school at 25? Do y'all know anybody? I don't know nobody. But he's being dealt with because of his size as though he's a grown man when he hasn't stepped into his manhood yet. And so it, I think it's to us, back in the day, you would have took him and did some community service with him. If he did something in your classroom, you would have kept him after class and spent the time inside. I work in Kansas Juvenile Correctional Complex. I work at the school. That is the hardest thing. We can't suspend a kid from school. You get what I'm saying? And if an officer comes to get him out, we can't lock them down. That is a mandate. You cannot lock a kid down for more than a certain amount of time in this state. So we have to change up our system of how we were doing things. We don't get to give him another charge because he had a behavior issue in the classroom or he got mad or he threw a chair. We learn to work with them. So we find the de de-escalation techniques. Not only do we find de-escalation techniques, we learn to have relationship with you. Not be in relationships. You get what I'm saying? That's a whole other thing. But you learn to have a relationship. You build a rapport. You get to know about his history. You get to know about his desires, what he wants to build, what he wants to do. And when we see the uniform sometimes, and I, I truly believe if we had access to a uniformed officer that was in the streets and we could just move them out, there are some students, and it would be our kids that are dealing with mental illnesses and our ethnic students that would probably be out to school. Because John can do one behavior and be perceived that he's not no harm, but when Joshua yells out, Joshua needs to get out. But they did the same behavior in a different way, and it's wrong to approach them that way. Some of our students are getting jail sentences, while others of our students are leaving. A group of young men got arrested right here in this town. The black youth stayed locked up, and the Caucasian son, who was part of the issue, he went home. And his mother said he had no business going home. Well, I'm but they glad, stayed there. I'm glad that I asked you that follow-up question. I appreciate the work that you do in community, and thank you for Thank you. The last person signed up to speak is Oshara Mishra. I don't have much to say. Um, I do want to... Um, reiterate and repeat something so we hear it um, just a couple more um, demands and it's with the people um, 
we demand provisions to overhaul qualified immunity for law enforcement and this be placed into the actual FOP contract. And earlier I already spoke about banning no no knock warrants. And also I had just wanted to um <coughs> I was just gonna talk about, you know, the council like I did before listening to the people. But tonight, um something was said that's not in relation to what I said earlier, but some of the city programs, I do want to say, I don't know if I'd ever be able to stand up here and say this, but the, um, I want to make sure that these, these funds that are coming in, that is really evenly distributed to people. It's one of the, one of the city programs that I used to work for was defunded, not defunded, but depleted because landlords, people with money came in and they took advantage of the programs for the for the um for the low income people so they took advantage of all these programs and then the people that needed it my job got taken away because of all that, that happened and i just want to make sure that you have provisions in there for landlords the people that really have money that they don't they, they just can't come in and take advantage of these programs that come in for low for low income people because it takes opportunities away from them and it takes um, money out of people that get the, even the low income jobs the grants that come in to help them do their job it takes their money away too if that other program is all depleted and I just hope you hear that part also so thank you thank you so much we now move on to an, uh, announcements uh city clerk the july 28th agenda includes a public hearing for a consolidated action plan public hearing for the budget and then consideration of budget amendments city manager i have no announcements tonight mayor uh councilman duncan uh, nothing this evening thank you councilman lesser the only announcement I would have is I think as, as the council, as we, as we move forward, and I brought this up last year um, when it came up, is if we're going to have a two-minute two minute announcement or a two-minute public comment, then it needs to be two minutes. If it, we want it to be three minutes, make it three minutes. If it's going to be four minutes, it needs to be four minutes. But um, my position is if we have a policy that it's <laughs> then it's two minutes. If we want to change that, I would I would say that someone wants to bring that forward, bring that forward. Thank you. That's all I got. Councilwoman Hiller. No announcements, just to thank you to the people that have come and stayed and, and testified. I know it's new ground and it's it's helpful. That's it, thank you. Councilwoman Maliviana. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had talked with the city manager uh, a day or two ago and I had asked him to give some additional agenda time because I still had a number of questions I had on information that the chief had provided that I had yet to go over. Crime stats, SROs in schools that I still had questions on, breakdown of arrest by race, gender, etc. Uh, and him and I had talked and we were, he thought tentatively maybe uh, August 21st. However, after the onslaught of mail emails that we have had from citizens across Topeka uh, that are wanting to not have the choppy kind of dialogue that we're having to fit it in uh, whenever we can because there is so much information that we're receiving. Uh, I'm requesting from the city manager specifically per the information that you provided me uh, earlier this afternoon uh, for a special session to discuss the multifaceted concerns uh, that I still have and that we know that the public has and, and a right to answers on those, uh, whether that be increased de-escalation, whether that be increased training on implicit bias. Um, I think that what it, it makes sense what the people are saying to have something more compact and I think that it would uh, be beneficial to have that type of meeting. I, from my understanding, 
uh, you can approve that. Um, and so that is what my request is at this point. Okay. So how long do I take? I mean, do you tell um, me that well, later? Well, the decision is whether or not to have the meeting is mine or mm -hmm. four council members can request to, to right. have that. Right. And, and so, so I think at this point, given this issue and all the other things that we're dealing with related to the budget, I think that um, it would be better if we have a majority of the governing body members or four that would like to have that meeting that they request that. Okay, so you're you're saying that you're deferring to the four. Yes, to four. I think that it's a decision that the governing body should make, not one person. Okay, so I would just say in that, then I will go ahead and uh, with Liz's help get an email sent out uh, tomorrow because we are talking about the budget, which is the people's money, and uh, the people here and through emails and all kinds of communication have been raising their voices to that's what they want to hear. So I hope uh, at least three other colleagues, uh, in addition to myself, will be willing to have that meeting, and I'll get that information sent out tomorrow. I, I don't know if it would be for August 4th. Okay. I, I don't know. I just, I'm just putting it. I'll send out emails tomorrow. And thank you for all those that have been attending. The meetings. Okay, Councilman, Deputy Mayor. Actually, no, Councilman Ortiz. I'm sorry, I, I meant I didn't mean to skip you. Deputy Mayor. Um, Mayor, I just want to say I, I, I just want to thank everyone for the incredible kindness they uh, they showed over the over this past couple of weeks with the, with the COVID-19 and. And uh, I do have to single out uh, you, Mayor. I mean, my God, you probably have 5,000 calls a day or emails and BS. Uh, you checked on me, uh, if not on a daily basis, several times a week. Uh, I want to thank everyone at church, uh, a couple of different churches who were praying for me and my family. Um, and I also uh, I, I have to single out a couple of council members who, who seem very blustery and uncaring, but yet, uh, Mike, Mike Lesser, who uh, evidently, evidently didn't think I was fat enough, so he brought me a blizzard from Dairy Queen. And uh, then also uh, yesterday, or not yesterday, a few days ago, my dog just started barking. And by the time I got to the door, I saw Sylvia Ortiz exiting, and she had dropped off like this uh, muscle milk uh, stuff, and which, which my, my sons love, so I didn't get any of it. But uh, I, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, you are a fantastic group of people, no matter what the rest of the city says. So, so thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone's thoughts and prayers. Hey, Tony, we're family. That's what we do. We take care of each other. Councilman Padilla. I can't talk that, Mayor. Thank you. You're so, muted. I think you're muted, Mayor. I think you're on mute, Madam Mayor, but I'm going to take that as my cue. <laughs> that was your cue. I'm so sorry. I kept on saying Councilman Benegar thinking, well, she's not listening. I, you know me. I'm very quiet and demure and just don't speak that much. Um, I am very, very appreciative of everybody who has been coming forward and speaking on behalf of movements like Black Lives Matter and just making sure that we're an equitable place to live. Um, know that your comments that your concerns are not going unanswered there's a lot going on behind the scenes because some of this stuff can't just happen overnight as everyone saw with um, councilman duncan's hard work today it's hard fought hard won and um know that we are continuing to work and talk about these issues pretty constantly even with the daunting um task of tackling the budget this is something that's important to many of us if not all of us, I don't want to speak on behalf of anybody, but um, it's something that's very important to me and we will continue to talk about it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Oh, and everyone stay safe and hydrated and masked up. Councilman Dobler. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just very quickly here, I have been concerned for some time about internet service in Topeka. Um, you know, I think it, it's been pointed out in a big way in the last three months that reliable high-speed 
low cost internet service is is really an essential service, almost like water and sewer. Um, and I know a lot of us have talked about it. Uh, Council members Padilla and Duncan and I uh, hashed it out uh, a few weeks ago. So the other day I became aware that the city of West Des Moines has instituted really what, what amounts to a city utility that provides conduit, not the fiber, but the conduit throughout, uh, throughout town. And then it allows uh, companies that want to run fiber through that condu conduit to uh, lease the conduit from the city. Um, I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail, but it looks like a reasonable way to uh, provide high speed, again, high speed access to the parts of town that really need it. And a lot of those parts of town where folks can't afford it. Um, this is really the first time I've seen something that looks like it might work. Um, and, and the interesting thing is we have a, head, a little bit of a head start. Uh, years ago when USD 501 started tying their schools together with fiber, they were able to lay fiber in the right way uh, at no cost to them. Uh, but as part of the agreement, they laid spare conduit uh, for the city's use. And I think that was put forth by the city of West Des Moines and, you know, figure out how to, how to move ahead. So really I'm, I'm asking, I'm going to ask the city manager and this can wait till budget is complete, but I'm going to ask the city manager to put together a task force, uh, to look into the potential of developing what's really an internet conduit network. Um, and I think it needs to be initially focused on North, East and Central Topeka. Take a look at the West Des Moines model, which appears to be working. There's a partnership with Google Fiber um, and, and we definitely need to look at that. I think obviously a partnership with GoTopeka, um, other, other, um, community members. Anyways, it's getting late. I'm getting a little bit off track here, but again, I'll, I'll send this information out to the council. Again, I'm going to ask the city manager to put together a task force and let's see if we can move this thing off dead center. I know I'm going to hear first thing I'm going to hear is, Hey, we got it. We got a study. We got this, we got that. Nothing's really happened. And as we debate, uh, school openings. I mean, we've already seen the first first three weeks of 501 are going to be online, I believe. And you know, I hear these stories about uh, three kids trying to do online school using one cell phone. We, you know, that's. I mean, it is. It's a digital equity issue, and it's something that we can approach. And I'm going to challenge uh, challenge the city to do that. that. I uh, hope I have some support. I appreciate or I received support from council members Padilla and Duncan. I appreciate that. And let's see where we can go with it. Yeah, so I'll get more info out and thank you very much. Councilman Gilbert, thank you so much. I hope that, thank you for, first of all, uh, everybody that has shown up every single night to talk about these issues that matter. Um, we've talked about housing and talking about bold moves to ensure that we have equitable housing and that we can start rectifying some of those challenges that we're having also with code enforcement. In addition to that, um, yes, Councilwoman Valeria Alcala. I'm sorry, can I ask a question when you're done? Sure. Um, and uh, it's it's been exciting to just see how our community feels comfortable coming to us and talking. Um, that is important. Um, our government is nothing but a group of people that are here to serve everybody. Um, and, and Councilman Dobler, I am elated that you're talking about this. And I think that specifically, because we have an issue, because of COVID, we should be taking a look at partly federal programs that we can start participating in partnership with our school districts to apply for dollars to help us make this happen. Because you are absolutely correct. Broadband has become an issue. Um, Lazone grades. We cannot have, uh, talk about broadband without talking about Lazone. 
because she has been advocating for this for years. Um, and COVID is, is bringing us back to that, that head point um, in which we need to do something because our kiddos are struggling. Not every child has access to broadband in their home. Um, and and we're, we're giving them Chromebooks to do their homework with. So I, I love these conversations. I love that everybody is bringing these things forward. Uh, Councilman Duncan, congratulations on a huge, huge moment tonight. So much appreciated of your, your leadership. Um, Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala, your question. I had a follow-up question about the uh, special uh, session. I was going to ask the city attorney. Is the city attorney not here? She's on Zoom. Is she on Zoom? I saw her name on Zoom. She was on here. It looks like it, she might have dropped out. Yeah. Okay. So... If the city attorney's not here, are we still supposed to have a meeting? I do have a question about the special session. I don't know if you can answer it, Mayor, or city manager. I was going to ask if uh, when I send the emails tomorrow to see who would be open to a special session, I know I need three more votes uh, to approve that. Would you count as one of those votes, Mayor, or are you abstain from that? I just want clarity. I don't know, especially when this comes to issues that, that pertain to potentially dealing with home rule things. As you notice, I did not have a chance to vote tonight on Councilman. Um, but when it comes to meetings, I don't know. So let's get with Lisa and um, we can figure out if, if I have that opportunity as well. City Manager? Yeah, I have the rules with me and it says regarding awesome. special governing body meetings. Special meetings may be called by the city manager, the mayor, or by four, mem four or more members of the council. So you would count in that, or you could do it on your own. But she, if, Perfect. so I could go to you and see, and then you could give me an answer one way or another. I just wanted to make sure I was reaching out to the right council people without Lisa being here. But thank you, Mayor. No worry, Mayor. Okay. okay. If I could throw one late-breaking news, news piece. Um, the broadband has been of, of great interest to me, too, and I have um, a heads up for particularly city manager and Neil, I guess. Um, I happen to be in a meeting with a number of people and the mayor and the head of the State Department administration this afternoon, and we ended up talking about broadband, and they told me that they are, the state has been in discussions with the federal government, and it looks like the CARES money is going to be opening up for digital access use, and so the timing of uh, Councilman Dobler's discovery, so let's all keep an eye on it, but it looks like it's gonna open up for broadband. Thank you. All right, all this being said, this meeting is adjourned. Have a wonderful evening.